Hello subscribers, good afternoon, morning, evening. I'm going to tell you the story about Murray King. Many of you have watched the clip on Murray and I want to tell you just what happened because it's a pretty amazing story. So let's think of the time. It's 1968 in New York City. Um, there's lots of 16 millimeter filmmakers around shooting all kinds of films, including me, and starting to get into the business of it and someone, surely something, she creates a documentary feature film in the theaters. You're seeing a documentary. It and that surfer movie that existed at that time were the only two. And she was making money. It was like a reality heroin addict story that you could make money on in the theaters on the big screen by blowing up 16 millimeter to 35 millimeter. So what a fascinating idea. So I'm sitting in my office in New York City, teeny little editing room. I'm a freelance filmmaker. And in walks this guy, Murray King, to sell me insurance. I didn't have any insurance. I was 27 years old, never thought about insurance. And he was outrageous. He came from 10 minutes from where I lived. He was kind of a, what makes Sammy run, if you're old enough to remember that movie, if you are, um, pushy, New York, happened to be Jewish, uh, aggressive guy, but he was charming. So I turned to him and I say, hey, you want to make a movie, a feature film? And he says, can I have a business card with my name that says producer? Because my clients would like that. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going on a junket to Las Vegas this Friday. It was a Monday. I said, I'll be there with a cameraman and an actress. So I'm going on Friday and I got to think out what kind of movie am I going to make? At the time, there was Cinema Verite, the Maisel's Brothers. Oh, well, we don't get involved with what's in front of the camera. We only film what we see. Come on, there's a cameraman there. He's usually in his 20s, it's usually a male, he's usually very good looking. There's a sound man with a boom, at least. There's a lighting guy, there's nobody there. Nobody's, so I thought this was ridiculous. I thought Cinema Verite was a joke, but everybody bought it in the arty documentary world. So I come up with staged reality. I say, since we're all creating these scenes anyway, nothing is cinema verite really, then let's uh, admit it. Let's see the camera, let's have some actresses, and let's call it stage reality. So I come up with this idea of stage reality. That's how I'm going to shoot King Murray. Junket to Las Vegas. Junket means a bunch of rich guys who he has sold insurance to, and he's going to take them to Vegas for fun. Vegas pays for the whole thing, Caesar's Palace. Oh boy, this is going to be a documentary feature film, say I. And I show up Friday and he meets my actress, Laura, and she's going to accompany him to Vegas so that we don't have to worry about releases and stuff like that. It's Murray and his friends and we're on the plane to Las Vegas. And we get to Las Vegas. I had never been there. Have you ever been there? Outrageous. Money. Girls. Alcohol. Gambling. I had not seen these things. I was from back east. The whole thing was like Caesar's Palace fountains and Murray's in a $10,000 a night room for free. And he's eating all this fancy stuff and he's drinking all the fancy stuff. And we're just filming. And I'm just creating ideas. Murray, how about you jump into the swimming pool and swim the whole pool? You'll see that scene. That's the scene in the movie. Murray, do this. Murray, get your hair done. And Murray comes up with some ideas too. Murray, get a massage. Uh, and he does all these scenes. So the days go by and the nights go by and I'm filming these scenes with Murray and some of them are staged, some of them are not, and they're just great. Murray is great. I'm on the last night, I'm in the casino gambling and with Murray and it's the first gambling scene. We've been there four days. All of a sudden, there's a knife in my back from a guy. I can see him standing behind me, a knife. No one had ever done anything that aggressive to me as a filmmaker. Producers taken out, Simon's taken out, and I'm told to leave Las Vegas that night if I don't want to die. Who tells me that? The sheriff of Las Vegas. The sheriff tells me. So they're all in cahoots. He says, you don't want to get involved with these guys. You've done something you shouldn't do. Leave Las Vegas and never come back and give us all your film. Do I do it? You bet. I can see my producer in the corner of his eye with a gun to his head in the casino. So I drive out of Las Vegas that night. The sheriff takes us to the airport. I'm gone. I'm back with my friends on Long Island. And I'm saying, I just shot a movie, a feature documentary, a great character, Murray King. He represents kind of the, 
extension of America in a way, the craziness of America, but he's basically a good guy. Um, it's gone. I forget about it, sort of. I talk to everybody about it. I'm bereft. Three months later, cold winter day, up shows a limo in front of my house I was staying in in Long Island, and a man gets out who I recognized. He had a silk tie and a silk suit, and he touched me with gloves on his hands. I remembered him from Las Vegas. Mr. Hoffman, we took your film. Uh, would you like it back? Yeah. Um, we've processed it at CFI in Los Angeles. We've checked everything. It's a very nice film. Would you like some money to back your movie? Uh, no thanks, just give me my movie back. I got my movie back. King Murray. I get an art director who designs the logo. I blow it up to 35 millimeter with a young single investor who just loves the cut. $65,000 it cost. And I enter it in the Cannes Film Festival. The Cannes Film Festival. Nobody had ever entered a documentary in the Cannes Film Festival. It's Hollywood. It's the big guys. I also get a young distributor. He had never distributed a film except for some film about marijuana in the theaters in New York to distribute the film. He loves it. And he opens it at the festival theater right before I go to Cannes where it gets an unbelievable audience. The audience is packed. Half the audience are filmmakers. Why is the audience there? Because it got reviews in every newspaper in New York. The Daily News, Pauline Kael, David Hoffman should be thrown out of America for making this movie. I'm making a movie about a guy from Long Island I know. It's quite innocent as far as I'm concerned. It certainly makes fun of a man who is abusing women in a way, and all of them were in a way. And I wanted to stick it to them for that, but I didn't see this as attacking America at the time. Remember, it's 1969. The colleges are rebelling like crazy. There's blood in the streets. America is fractured over Vietnam. The world is hitting on our heads. I didn't take any of that into account as a New York filmmaker. So Pauline Kael says, terrible movie. Uh, the Wall Street Journal says, one of the best 10 films of the year, the equal of the Maisel's Brothers Cinema Verite movie, Salesman. The New York Times, fantastic review. This is a brilliant work of art. And some other guy says, David Hoffman is the Fellini of America. So for the first time in my life, I'm caught in publicity, being talked about in the press. I, I've never been a documentary guy. You don't get that kind of press, if you will. Film opens. In the first one minute, when the limousine pulls down the driveway and Murray's in the limousine to go off for his workday, three people stand up, say, I'm not watching this piece of shit and they walk out. And I'm in the back of the theater like this, and I don't know, why are they walking out? Why are they mad? What's getting them mad about this movie? Anyway, the movie airs, and it is incredibly popular with filmmakers, runs rather in the theater, Festival Theater, 57th Street, incredible popular with movie makers. They're coming every night, but nobody else is coming. Nobody wants to see my documentary. Then I go to Cannes. At the Cannes Film Festival, we got in, invited. And we go to run our film and we find a full audience. Why is the audience there? Because we won the Simon de la Critique, the French Critics Award. The number one award at Cannes, in a way, is what do the French critics say is the movie should win. Not what does the Hollywood judges say, but what does the critics say? We won the Critics Award and who's there? Peter Fonda, because he had made a film, Easy Rider, which I believe if it won, I think it won, but it may not have won, but it was up there. And he says, hey, your film's way better than mine. It's real. There's Peter Fonda, there's Dennis Hopper. This is a classic. And everybody's loving the film. And a French distributor comes up and he says, we'd like to distribute this film in France, in Paris. We will open it. It is a work of art. Another guy says to me, as the Fellini of America, I'd like to offer you a three-picture Hollywood deal as a director. A million dollars a picture. Go and make more movies like this. The story's not over yet. I know it's getting long, but I think you'll stick with me on this. So um, it, the French open the movie, it lasts a year. Why? Because it, they think it's a, making fun of Americans. It's 1968, 69, people want to make fun of Americans in the world. They don't like what we're doing in the world. And maybe they have other reasons as well, other than Vietnam. Um, back in America, I'd like to open the film in a variety of theaters. And the guy that is 
backing me, he, even though it didn't go in New York, he feels it will go, and Murray King sues me. You have made fun of me and hurt my business. I said, Murray, I didn't make fun of you. I'm telling you, an audience would love it. So I go to the local college, we have a screening, uh, theater is again packed, and the audience, about two thirds of the audience at least, loves Murray, these are students. They say, we think you're funny, you're charming, you're outrageous, but you're bold. So Murray backs away from the lawsuit and he stops suing us and the film hopefully is going to run places, but it doesn't. Wherever it goes, it's filmmakers looking at it and nobody else. And I'm saying, this is dramatic. But of course, nobody died. Nobody was raped. No ship sank. No heroin addict. No um, roller derby with the girls with beautiful bosoms and great butts. No um, Woodstock with rock and roll stars. No, uh, some guy did a film on a preacher, a 13-year-old preacher. Same kind of thing. I didn't have any of that. So it died, sort of. Who kept it up were the film schools, even today. It runs in these film schools as an art program. Look at this quote-unquote stage reality, which the director called true reality. Because in a documentary, nothing is real. Everything is a point of view towards the reality. Yes, I staged scenes, but in those scenes, Murray was Murray. He was Murray more than he ever would have been if I had sort of just followed him around. So what's the end of this story? Well, first of all, Murray went back to Las Vegas. By the way, he was kicked out too, and he sells all the big mafia guys insurance. He was so good that he sold the guys who threatened us insurance. He was very happy with the whole thing. Met a bunch of people, became a movie star, got his um, kind of piece of legacy. And I think Murray died at 90, a terrific life. He was always conflicted about the film. Maybe it was great, maybe it wasn't. But Murray King goes down in my career as a defining moment in my life for two reasons. One, I got this offer to go to Hollywood. And I'm going to tell you in another video, because I don't want to take too much of your time, um, what happened to me when I went to Hollywood to do these three documentaries. And also, I kind of got fed up with New York. It was getting wild and crazy, so I moved to Maine. That's another story. Thank you for this. Please support me on Patreon if so inclined. And I hope this is meant to you what it's meant to me, which is to share with you, my subscribers, a little piece of my life as a filmmaker. Till next time.